season one on the Violet. We and Michael began to realize he was having physical issues that led to psychological issues in terms of you know, all the delusional behaviors. <clears throat> you, it's the kind of thing where you see messages to yourself in newspapers and magazines or you hear voices or <coughs> you're being surveilled by the FBI, those kinds of things. And Michael was <coughs> having issues that he was aware of, we were aware of. It. And it's the kind of thing to be corrected. And that's one thing we wanted to talk to him about it and want to know. These are things that can be addressed through medication, through treatment. But we were in the middle of shooting, well, last third of shooting. And what do we do about this? And I thought about it <coughs> really hard. And you can't, I could write them out for a couple of episodes, but I couldn't write them out long enough to get the kind of help you really needed. And I was prepared to shut down the show, to make sure we got the help we needed. And Michael came to my office and we talked about this. He said, don't do it. Don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. Don't let me be the reason that these people lose their jobs and that this show falls. Let me try. Let me try and get by. And those three words, let me try, are kind of like giving me a chance in my prayer tonight. And if I hear that, I have to back the play. Always have, always will. And he soldiered on under a burden that no one else knew about. And he got through that season like a man clinging to a cliff by his fingernails. And I could see him suffering. I could see him fighting every day to stay controlled, to stay focused. And again, the raw, naked courage of the man to keep fighting. And we finished the season at no one day. <clears throat> and he knew he wasn't going to be able to come back for a second season. I knew it. He, he, he couldn't take the strength. And he needed to get the help he needed. <clears throat> so we agreed to part ways at that point. <coughs> I said, I will bring you back to finish up your arc of your character. We will shoot a short scene now that I can drop in at some appropriate point in the story, saying you're going to come back and give me a message to Garibaldi. Don't worry about rent or food or the don't the world, just take care of you. And he spent the next X number of months. His family came to the fore, his friends came to the fore. My wife at the time, Catherine Trennan, was a huge help to him. Uh, Sandra Bruckner, who later on ran the Levi Fan Club, uh, is aware of this, um, was a huge help. And they were working through various nets with him to get you know him on target. And gradually began to work, began to, to take root. Uh, it was a hard, hard, hard process. Um, and we went to, uh, to the first convention we had to do after that was, I think it was Icon in Long Island. Uh, pretty sure it was Icon. And Michael was there, I made a point to be there for him with Michael. And I was seeing him right before he went in. And he was pale from the medication and his hands trembled. But he was determined to go on. And what was amazing was I saw him walk into a room with you, with the fans. The color came back to his cheeks. The confidence came back. You, the group, sustained him and empowered him and brought him to life in ways no medication ever could. Funny small story. On the way back from the convention, <clears throat> we were driving down the freeway. I had a van with myself, Catherine, and Michael. <coughs> and we heard this sound like a motorcycle war, the, the, the obnoxious kind of motorcycle war kind of thing. And I looked to the left, I don't see a motorcycle. I looked to the right, I don't see a motorcycle. I look behind us, nothing. And then I looked forward, and I see two airplane wheels coming down in front of the windshield. This is a really bad sign. <laughs> and the driver puts the brakes on and this plane that was doing emergency landing shoots right past us. 
and lands on the freeway. <laughs> this small private plane. You know, and it was like six inches of taking out the car. Yeah. And maybe that was why you know, Michael was thinking in terms of what he did, because when he convened to do the two parter, and he was again strong, and he was there, and he was prepared, and got through it, and we were talking again about the whole situation, and that's when he said what he said. Um, and in the years that followed, you know, he tried to get his career going. There was good days, some bad days, some on bed, some off bed. And it took a toll. It took a toll. But his family was there for him. His friends were there for him. And finally, he left us uh, a little while ago and ended that story. But I wanted you to know from what he's always said to me and what I've seen in my, in my lives, how much he loved you guys, and how much you mattered to him, and how much you sustained him. I'm not sure he would have made it as far as he did, if not for you. But see, the answer he did do a couple of things, he always came back revived and better and stronger because of you. And my hope is that the people who are on this program are still with us a thousand years from now. I don't know if that will be the case. So, as you move amongst them, as well as celebrating what has been done, and what is being done, take a moment and look at them as Andrea looked at us. Be generous with your kindness, with your words, your affection. Remember the moment. And when you go home, take that with you. And look at your friends and your family as Andrea spoke to us. Hold those moments. Because flesh is stable.